Welcome to my session uh, here at OpenSUSE uh, conference, uh, which is on authentication with CunEDM or identity management above the sea. Who am I? My name is William Brown. I'm a senior software engineer at SUSE Labs. In my day job at SUSE, I work on 389 Directory Server, which is one of the major LDAP servers used in open source today. I'm based in Queensland, Australia, which means it's pretty likely that I haven't met most of you or interacted with a lot of you. This is generally because I am asleep at the times when you're active and awake because I live on the other side of the planet. So my preferred time zone as a result is UTC plus 10. So if you want to get in contact with me and have any questions about this uh, presentation, please send me an email at wbrown at suza.de. Now, all of us would probably be pre pretty familiar with a screen that looks something like this, where when we access one of our laptops or computers, we're asked to provide a username and password to identify ourselves. And this isn't just something which we do on our personal devices. This kind of idea of authenticating and interacting with things really spans the world around us. For example, universities, large businesses, banks, bookstores, even financial transactions all require some kind of authentication for us to interact with and use those systems. Authentication has been a really critical part of computer security for a long time. And um, it, it originated in 1961 with MIT's compatible time sharing system. See, this idea of authenticating to a computer system really started around the idea of how do we manage who has access to what resources. The um, system in, pic in question, uh, which is pictured, it uh, had a finite amount of computing resource. And so as a result, people were asked to log in and that login would grant a set of limits or resources as to how much CPU time and memory that individual could use. This idea of authenticating to gain access to a set of resources is really still why we have authentication to computer systems today. And those resources can really value in what uh, can really vary in what they are. For example, when you um, authenticate to your phone, you're accessing a resource which is to do with generally private content and private information, such as your messages and phone calls. When you access your laptop, it could be that you're accessing private documents, or you don't want somebody else to be using your compute resource or your GPU resource because that's for you to play games on. Or even when you're a business, we need to authenticate to systems within a workplace because we may have access to things like customer data or security sensitive materials, and we need to limit who is able to access what, as well as identifying who has accessed what. But authentication really is the fundamental thing that underpins all of our system security um, when humans are interacting with that system in so that we can look at who is doing what and who, what are people allowed to do. Within open source, we've had a, um, two major ways of identifying ourselves to systems. The first major one is LDAP. LDAP is a binary protocol, very similar to SQL or HTTP, and it allows accessing a directory database, uh, which is very similar to a phone book. This phone book or directory contains a set of users and groups. And this allows um, computers that are connected to read that LDAP server to identify what users and groups may exist. And then of course, that user and group information can be used to determine what access or resources that individual has the ability to use. As a side effect of the way that LDAP works, it is also possible to check users' passwords through the, uh, which is associated to their account. LDAP was created in 1997 as a successor to the Directory Access Protocol, which is part of the X500 standards. X500 are a series of standards created by the International Telecom Union and covers a lot of things like X509 certificates. In fact, X509 certificates were intended to be the authentication mechanism for authenticating to a directory. The data in one of these directories is not structured the same way as a table like in SQL, but it's much closer to JSON. These objects or entries contain a lot of key value pairs and the content of what key value pairs can exist is defined by a schema. In addition, these entries can be nested and structured into a tree, allowing hierarchical organization and searching capabilities, which is really um, allows a lot of rich kind of querying and, and structural elements to LDAP. 
The other major authentication protocol that we've used heavily in open source is Kerberos, and it was invented in the 1980s. Its current iteration of the protocol version 5 was created in 1993. See, this is actually a bit pretty important because SSL and TLS weren't created until 1995. And back in the 90s and early 2000s, cryptographic operations were expensive on CPUs anyway. So TLS for all connections wasn't always feasible. This led to Kerberos being developed as a way to authenticate over an insecure network where traffic was actively being intercepted and viewed. So Kerberos is a system that allows authentication without ever transmitting the password over the network. It was later made possible for Kerberos to install network encryption layers, very similar to what TLS does today, where effectively Kerberos becomes your root of trust rather than a certificate authority like we have today. These protocols are used widely in open source, but the four major um, identity management systems that really take these protocols and build systems up and around them are OpenLDAP, FreeIPA, Samba, and 389 Directory Server. It's very likely that if you have an open source identity management system, it probably has one of these four components in some way, shape, or form. Now, there certainly are others, but these are probably the big four. So OpenLDAP is the original and kind of de facto LDAP standard. It's actually derived from the original code um, where LDAP was originally invented from. 389 Directory Server is a, another LDAP server which is developed um, and has a different lineage and history and is now developed actively by SUSE and other companies. FreeIPA is an open source identity management project which combines 389 Directory Server, MIT Kerberos, and a number of other parts to make a full, you know, out of box identity management stack that people can deploy and use. And Samba 4 is a really interesting one. This is a combination of Heimdall Kerberos um, and a customized LDAP server, which is actually a re-implementation of Microsoft's Active Directory. So it's a clean room, open source implementation of the protocols that are Microsoft Active Directory. And all of these and the others uh, technologies within open source have actually worked really well for a long time. And there's a lot of reasons why they have. They have great performance and availability. Um, these systems tend to have active, active, uh, eventually consistent replication. And that means you can have very wide geographic distribution of your servers, which gives you a lot of access and uptime and reliability. They're all extensible. You can extend the database schema for your business's needs. You can add extra attributes and you can really build a very flexible system, which is um, correct or representative of your use case. And they're widely compatible. You know, it's very rare to find a piece of software that does not have an LDAP authentication plugin available for it. And so as a result, because of this, it's very common for a business to go, well, it has to have LDAP as support because else all of our other applications won't be able to authenticate. And it's because of these things that have worked really well, this idea exists that authentication is considered solved or boring um, because, you know, all of these things have just worked. So here is the timeline of how these projects were developed and introduced. OpenLDAP from 1997, 389 in 2005, FreeIPA in 2008, and Samba 4 in 2012. Now, the world is not just comprised of open source. There have been a lot of other things that have changed within identity management. In parallel, we've seen a lot of other things, especially in proprietary technologies, developing in identity management and authentication systems. We see the rise of OpenID and OAuth. We see identity as a service through things like G Suite, Okta, Ortho, and Azure Active Directory Sync. And we start to see the rise of hardware-backed cryptographic authenticators with things like Windows Hello, Apple's Touch ID, and WebAuthn. Now, what's really interesting about these is that a lot of these things are very clean slate. You know, OAuth and OpenID are single sign-on mechanisms, but they don't take anything from Kerberos, for example. Um, most of these identity as a service platforms are all clean slate, and they might have LDAP compatibility gateways in some cases, but most of them do not. They're all web first. And all of these are gaining a lot of popularity due to their ease of use, their integrations, and what they're doing to advance the state of identity management. 
And this is really interesting because the LDAP and Kerberos focus technologies that exist within open source, the latest standard supported by any of them was TOTP, which was introduced in 2011. The TOTP standard um, is only supported in FreeRPA and OpenLDAP. And you know this is the latest state of the art that open source has when it comes to identity management and authentication. And it really just feels like you know, this LDAP and Kerberos focus is in a way preventing us from catching up to these more HTTP focused um, designs that we're seeing in proprietary technologies. And that's the thing is that LDAP and Kerberos as technologies, while they've served us really well, they do also hold us back in a lot of ways. For example, they're password only. Um, you know, and, and attacks on passwords have become really, really good these days. You know, many people within information security, and there are some excellent blogs from the Microsoft Security Response Center talking about password security as exists today. And, you know, they discuss um, that, look, the complexity of your password, the number of special characters, length, all of this, it doesn't matter because the most modern attacks that exist today against accounts are able to get the exact content of the password. And this means that a lot of the historical rules we've had about how to secure passwords are now irrelevant. A lot of these identity management stacks that we have are primarily written in C. And unfortunately, this opens us up to a lot of CVEs and memory safety issues. Both Google and Microsoft have publicly disclosed that 70% of their security issues come just from memory safety issues, which exist primarily in C and C++ code bases. Because these code bases are written in C and the developers of these identity management stacks knows of these risks, they tend to be very conservative and slow to improve and adapt because that's the only way that you can actually then take more care to make sure that we're not introducing these new issues. And because they're slower to improve and adapt, they're slower to keep up and make these developments and it adds extra barriers and complexities to improvement. The standards that exist around LDAP and Kerberos also tend not to be very active. LDAP especially has not had a working um, IETF group in a long time. And the last attempt to revive it that I'm aware of in 2017 has failed. Um, and I think that was the second or third attempt to revive it. So it's very unlikely that we're going to see any kind of developments or improvements in LDAP as a protocol to reflect the changes that are required for modern identity management and where we're going. And of course, these things are all complicated to administer. No one ever says, hey, LDAP is fun to set up. Kerberos is fun to debug. These things tend, when you bring them up with people, people tend to say, oh, you know, LDAP and Kerberos, they're so bad to use and I try and avoid them and they're so complicated. You know, if these technologies are complicated to administer and use, we're not going to be successful in getting people to want to integrate with our authentication systems and to want to improve that developer experience and um, those integrations. So for me, I'm you know, very passionate about authentication and identity management. And, and I'm you know, being part of this team and the history that I have with open source IDM, you know, I felt like I was in this trap where you know, I was in this difficult situation where I was always having to say no to people. When people said, hey, can we have this multi-factor authentication? It's like, well, no, we can't because we're bound by what LDAP can do. Oh, can we add this? Um, Web gateway, well, no, because it's extraordinarily difficult to try and add web um, components into a C code base without adding huge numbers of security risks. You know, I felt like I was always having to say no. And so, you know, I started to ask this question, which was why couldn't we have an open source IDM, which is as good as Azure Active Directory or Okta, but you can run it yourself like FreeRPA or Sun before, that really focused on this HTTP first, um, you know, kind of technologies, but also did not throw away the kind of existing infrastructure integrations that we value and care about in open source technologies. And really got away from this LDAP and Kerberos centric mindset that was holding us back and trapping us within these legacy ideas um, uh, that, that really prevented us from being able to progress. So in September 2018, I started a new project and that project is CunyDM. CunyDM is an identity management system written in Rust. And it is 
aiming to be the open source identity management stack uh, of the future. And I really wanted to create something which learnt lessons from past successes and mistakes of both open source and proprietary technologies. Something that was focused on being an identity management platform first and foremost, and you know, really captured a lot of these more modern ideas um, than, than the other systems that we currently have today. So some of these key things are you know, that it has to be HTTP first, it has to have web APIs, that we need to be looking at things like OAuth and OpenID uh, Open Connect, sorry. You know, devices are being part of your identity rather than being centered around the password. Um, how do we make sure that people can move around and go offline and be disconnected, um, especially with a very remote first um, and remote work uh, focused world that we now live in uh, due to the current situation. So there's a lot of things that, you know, as a project we can already do and have been doing. So, you know, from our open source perspective and our, you know, Linux perspective, our most important things is, can I authenticate my service to it? And the answer is yes. So today we already have working PAM and NS switch modules, which are all part of OpenSUSE already. Um, and you are able to set up the Unix resolver to authenticate to a CunyDM server. Now this resolver is actually inspired by SSSD, and it allows things like offline authentication and offline caching of user and group information so that you can actually pick up your laptop, go out to a coffee shop and come back or you know, have an internet disconnection and it will keep working. So um, we've already been inspired by it and learned a lot of things like, you know, we've learned from a, some of the mistakes and some of the good parts of SSSD in how we've designed this resolver to work. We already have SSH key management as well. So you can upload your SSH keys into CunyDM and then these are distributed through that same Unix resolver so that you can SSH into machines. And again, this enables all the same um, things where if um, systems are disconnected or offline, your SSH keys can still be validated. One of the really cool things that we have planned is SSH CA management, which is where uh, CunyDM can act as an SSH CA route and then sign short-term ephemeral keys that can then be used by a single individual. And this, is def this is a feature that's really today only seen in cloud identity and access managers. Um, and I think that this is something that we are really wanting to pursue. If you wanna know more about SSH CAs, I highly encourage you to watch Jeremy Stott's Linux Conf Australia 2020 talk, Zero Trust SSH. It's an amazing talk, really well presented and very fun. We've already had a couple of really cool successes with this SSH key management though, where one of our um, users in the community, they had locked themselves out of their server because of a mistake that they, when they um, ran an Ansible playbook. However, they realized that they had the ability to put SSH keys into Cunny, and so they were then able to create an extra account, upload SSH keys into it, and then log into that machine, and then recover their system. Um, and so this was actually really cool uh, to hear that they were able to you know, use this and rely on it um, when they needed it. We've also done a lot in terms of you know, early foundational um, design, knowing that you know, the goal of an identity management system is to scale to thousands of users. Um, so the entire system is set up to be concurrent from day one. So we've, we use all concurrent data structures and we even invented a new transactional caching system which allows multi-view concurrent um, data in your cache to exist. Um, and this fully transactional design is really, um, good because uh, it means that all the data in the system is always consistent. And this was inspired by ZFS, which has the copy on write file system, which really prioritizes data safety, but also concurrency and parallelism for extreme levels of performance. Because of this, we've already measured that CunyDM is close to the performance of 389 directory server. On a four core machine with eight gigabytes of RAM on NVMe disk, we already measured CunyDM as being able to do 32,000 searches per second and 3,000 authentications per second. We also have, um, we're also the first of the open source identity management projects to include a query optimizer. 
And we've, I've been working with someone who specializes in statistics to ask them about some ways that we can model our indexes and use statistical analysis to actually indicate to our query optimizer how the query optimizer should work and make better queries so that it can use the indexes in the system more effectively. From day one, we planned that devices were part of your authentication and they're not something you separate from. You know, you might log into your laptop and then your laptop has SSH keys that continue to authenticate you on your behalf. The device is representing you in the future authentication. So in the future, this will only improve with things like WebAuthn. And so from that reason, multi-factor authentication uh, was planned from day one. And this is the reason why as a project, we also wrote the library for WebAuthn in Rust. Today, it already supports Apple's Touch ID, Windows Hello, YubiKeys, Nitro Keys, and many more. It's also possible, you know, in the future, that you may use these devices as your sole source of authentication, as a, so as a cryptographic authentication only, where you may have the fingerprint reader and the fingerprint is stored in the secure enclave, you authenticate to your enclave, and then that does a uh, elliptic curve cryptographic operation to sign some data and then release that. And this gives a really strong level of multi-factor authentication without ever having to transmit a password. We also do some other really interesting stuff in the way that we have approached um, this device's password concept where um, traditionally with something like LDAP or Samba, uh, if you wanted to have radius for your Wi-Fi for network authentication or for your VPNs, generally, your primary password is also the password used by Radius. And this creates some really interesting problems. So one of the common ones in an enterprise is that um, if you change your password um, and you forget to update, say, your Wi-Fi password of your account on your phone and that's back somewhere else, that phone will keep trying to log in and then eventually cause your account to be soft locked out of the network. And then you have to phone up support staff and get them to help, but then they have to tell you which device you gotta go fix and you gotta do that. And then they've gotta unlock your account and it's a, it's a right pain. Um, and I've experienced this firsthand when I was a system administrator at a university where this really made it very painful for users to change their password. And so sometimes, even if they knew their password had been compromised, they didn't wanna change it because it was such a hassle. So what we do in Cunny is we don't want this to be the case. Your Radius password is actually separate. It's stored in your account and it's separate from all of your other device credentials. The idea is that on your device, you should be able to scan a unique code for those devices and roll them into the network. And that password is only your token for access in that network. No other resources on that um, system. So if your Radius password is compromised, it doesn't compromise your account. And by the same token, if you have to change your account password, you're not going to break your device's access to the network because your um, device password is still consistent. This also then leads us to some really cool ideas about how we can use QR codes to automatically enroll devices onto Wi-Fi um, and you know, how we can actually enroll devices um, which have built-in inseparable authenticators like Touch ID. So you can actually say, hey, I want to enroll a new device and then have a trusted workflow to enroll that and authenticate that device onto your account as that part of that device authentication policy that I was talking about. But as we mentioned, we already have WebAuthn. And you know, one of the things that we've recently done um, over January was we actually uh, started to develop a, a demo demonstration UI and, and um, workflow of WebAuthn working. And you can actually have an account that solely uses WebAuthn to authenticate. And as you can see here, we've just done a WebAuthn authentication and it works. Um, and I think we are the only open source identity management project um, that already actually supports WebAuthn in this way. And this area, this space will continue to improve as we do more work on um, improving our web user interfaces and those integrations. Of course, we still also have the classics, um, things like TOTP for um, cases where you may not have those devices that support platform authenticators or YubiKeys. And so we still have ways to do MFA with TOTP. And of course, we have all the, the normal things that you would expect, like your QR codes and, and things like that. Um, of course, Almost everything that you're seeing here can all be set up on the command line and used on the command line. You can use your WebAuthn tokens on the CLI the same way that you can use them in the browser. And in fact, you can use 
if you can, you enroll it on the CLI and it'll work in the browser and vice versa. Um, we have a WebAuthn compliant CLI library. Something else that we have is we actually have an LDAP gateway built into Cunny. And this, um, you know, as much as we don't want to be LDAP and be bound by those ideas, LDAP is still important as the linga franca of authentication. We still need to be able to expose um, data over LDAP in a way that um, applications are going to be able to effectively consume and authenticate with. And this really helps to bridge and um, you know, legacy compatibility with applications that may not have newer protocols or different ways of managing accounts. So for example, you may have a um, like Nextcloud instance and it uses LDAP to populate the user accounts, but it might use OAuth to actually do the authentication, for example. One of my really important goals though, and something that I addressed early on was that, you know, LDAP and Kerberos are considered difficult to administer. And this is something that I really wanted to address in Cunny. I wanted something that was easy to start with, easy to administer, very clear and direct and communicated well, but still allowed rich and um, advanced um, interactions. So here we see a configuration file for a, um, for a Cunny server. We have the bind address for HTTPS, the LDAP bind address for the LDAP compatibility gateway, where our database path is, what our TLS certificates are with a chain file and a, t and a key. And these are done as chain and a key because this is the exact format you get straight back from Let's Encrypt. Um, what log level and what our directory server, uh, what our origin is, what domain name will be accessed at. And from this file, we've, we can see that we have these files laid out in a data volume for Docker at the moment. Um, and so we have our server.tom, which is config, and we have those TLS files that we just mentioned. So the very first thing that we're going to do in order to set up our new instance is we're going to run an account recovery. So we're going to recover the administrator account. And you can see that on the right hand side with the, the Cunny DM recover account command here. When you run this account recovery, this is actually going to um, do a first run and setup of your database. And you can now see that cunnydm.db exists. It always um, will migrate and create the database on the first run. You don't need to do any other special setup steps. And that's it. We're now running a cunnydm instance and have our first admin account recovered. And we can then go and do stuff from there. And um, there's no default passwords, none of that. So you have to set something um, secure and good from the start. And it's really easy for clients to authenticate and work with Cunny as well. Um, for example, if we look at the client configuration, it just has the URL, our certificate verification where our CA path is, um, because certificates are our root of trust here. Now note in this example, I have to use verify hostnames false because of um, the way that I've set up the certificate for this demo. Um, in a production instance, you should not do this. Um, and so because of this like simplicity, like it's really easy to get started. And you can see that, you know, we have our CLI tool that we can immediately start to use. Um, and it has like functions for managing accounts, groups, the recycle bin. So if you delete something, you can bring it back, um, things like that. So we can now log in to the anonymous account which has the same uh, kind of principles as the LDAP anonymous account. Um, and from there, we can actually begin to start looking at some of the content that exists within our directory. So we can list the default accounts and we can see that we have the IDM admin, an admin account and an anonymous account. And the reason why anonymous is its own account is because this way you can manage it like every other account. You can lock it, you can expire its credentials, you can give it valid time, you can give it time windows of when it's allowed to be used. You can add it or remove it from different permission groups so that it can have permissions managed the same way as anyone else. Um, and of course, you can just create more accounts, you can create groups, you can add members of them, all of that kind of thing. You know, all of your very standard core elements of what you'd want from an identity management stack. And I'm really excited about this, you know, and I think that IDM is super exciting and I'm so keen for where CunnyDM has been going and what we've already achieved so far. Um, it underpins so much of our life every day and, you know, 
there are so many things that we should be able to do with it and we should all be able to have access to. Right now, the Cunningham project has really been growing quite a bit. Um, we now contain seven different sub projects. We've had so many contributors. We've had more than 350 commits since 2019 when it was first open sourced. And there have been so many non-code contributions, such as people raising issues, discussing things in our chat, uh, advising people, giving people help, things like that, which have been super valuable. You know, we have an extensive set of documentation in a book, which makes it really easy for people to get started. We have, you know, a few people who have really helped with continuous integration and test development. We have a couple of people who've helped with, um, you know, teaching about statistics. Um, we now have two Google Summer of Code students who have both begun to work on the project and they're both looking at some really interesting components. One is um, how we can do account recovery in, um, with multi-factor accounts and the other one has started to tackle how we can do and improve our logging for um, machine readable outputs for things like Splunk or um, Elk Stacks. We've also had um, people from the SUSE security team who have already reviewed um, some of the more security critical parts of the code such as the cryptographic operations and the PAM and the NS switch libraries and some of those things like managing home directories. And, you know, they turned up a few minor issues, but, you know, they, they were very satisfied with the quality of the code. Um, we've had a few people, you know, really helping out with the WebAuthn components. You know, there's been so much that has happened within this space. And it's really exciting for me because IDM really spans so many different areas and it really has something of interest for many different types of people. What's coming up for us is at the moment, we're currently working on uh, OAuth. So we're going to work on developing OAuth integration so that you can have different applications there. And once we have OAuth integration, then we can start looking at OIDC or OpenID Connect, um, which builds on top of OAuth to be able to transmit identity information. And this is a um, very widely supported modern web single sign-on protocol. And hopefully once that's all done um, in the next few months, then we're gonna start looking at replication and we're planning to do um, eventually consistent replication, very similar to 389. So I hope you found this really interesting and I would really love to hear from you about your ideas, comments, or even try it out. Uh, CunnyDM is already inside OpenSUSE. Uh, in Tumbleweed, you can already install it today and we release every, um, every quarter. We just say, you know, on the first of every couple of months, we, we do a release. The next release will be coming up on the 1st of July um, and it will go straight into Tumbleweed and you know, we'll continue to improve and upgrade that, um, that technology and that identity management and what we can do inside of um, SUSE Linux. So thank you so much for your time and attention and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.